Financial Projections and Proformas, prepared for and presented at the 2016 Square One Entrepreneurship Training Program. Square One is a program of the Center for Emerging Technologies. CET is an affiliate of the Cortex Innovation Community. Square One is funded in part by the Missouri Technology Corporation. So tonight I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about financial operations and financial operations modeling. I think I'm probably going to start this evening with a little bit of a story about how you know, our modeling, you know, our own modeling through atomic revenue kind of came about when I was standing here right about this time you know, last year. So, you know, our, for anybody that knows us, you know, we're essentially a company that's focused on marketing operations, sales operations, and the discipline of customer success to impact the company's lead generation, sales conversion revenue, so on and so forth. Um, as part of that, when we're engaged with a client, we, we're running into a little bit of an operational problem with the client's pricing. and. And we were the ones when, when ML was here a couple of weeks ago, she presented pricing strategy, you know, which was part of Atomic Revenue as well. Um, you know, but in that, we started, you know, we got involved in financial operations modeling simply because we were trying to just, you know, find out what the issue was with our clients' pricing. And then we eventually turned that into um, what we would call, you know, which was our initial financial model, which basically just simply covered selling general and administrative expenses. And I think, you know, as we go through the definitions, we've since then, we've greatly expanded out our model. We've actually had it validated by four accounting firms here in St. Louis. And, you know, when, but the thing I want to kind of talk about when we speak to financial operations modeling is, is that I am not an accountant. Nobody in our company is an accountant. We don't profess to be accountants. We view financial operations modeling more as a management budgetary exercise than we do as an accounting exercise. And that's the perspective in which I'll be taking you through the journey this evening. I probably won't be taking a lot of questions until the end just because a lot of the questions that you may have will probably be covered at different points of the slide. If they're not, then we can definitely have some interactive dialogue back and forth. Um, but if there's you know, questions from the mentors where they you know, want to add clarification to any of my comments, by all means, you know, please do so. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about this evening is I'm going to actually not start here. I'm going to start here in what is, a, what is the purpose of financial modeling? You know, what is a financial model all about? And the, the way that we frame this is that it's about truly understanding the capability in your business. So some of the elements in that are giving thoughtful consideration to how you will actually acquire customers. Additionally, we want you to give thoughtful organization for how you're going to manage the cost to acquire those customers. And you know, since we've done a number of these you know, financial models for companies ourselves, these are the biggest you know, pratfalls, if you will, that we keep seeing time and time again. And so these are things that we're trying to give you advanced education so that you can avoid these things. Um, and then the understanding that modeling is planning and that financial planning is a process and it has to be viewed as a process in order to be successful that's centered around understanding and managing what your, the potential of your particular business is and in making sure that that's realistic. And the thing is that there's an element of customization for this because you know, what is going to be an appropriate financial model for a Christmas tree business is going to be far different than a company that is, you know, let's say, doing SaaS, which is software as a service. Um, so there's going to be different models, and it has to be customized to, to your particular business. Now, what is financial modeling not? because there's a lot of things that are floating around in, in the ecosystem, and I'm going to be working to address you know, what, I, what we see as some of those myths that are floating around. 
What it is not is, is that, you know, is how many of you have heard of arch grants? How many of you have maybe applied for arch grants? Are there, are there any in the room? Okay, so that's essentially a, a pitch competition. But you know, one of the things that we heard that was you know, floating around was is that you have to, in arch grants, in order to be, you know, I guess how you'd say, you know, considered and, and viewed as very viable for arch grants was that you had to have crazy, crazy revenue. And you know, the, the thing is, is that the, in the ecosystem, some of these financial models that the companies are putting together are evolving in the marketing exercises versus a realistic assessment of the capability of the business. So you know, the idea of making up revenue you know, so that you can woo investors or so that you can grab the attention of investors is not something that we would recognize as being the, the purpose of your financial modeling. Um, one thing that we also see a lot is, you know, is what we call plug-in numbers. Who can tell me what plug-in numbers are? Do you have the difference between how much you think you're going to actually earn and how much you actually want to spend and you plug a number in in between to make them work? Yeah. So you know, plug-in numbers essentially are, this is how it gets represented, is, well, I think we're probably going to go to about three trade shows this year, and they're going to be you know, about $10,000 a piece. So just divide that out and spread it across the entire budget. So there is something called zero-based budgeting exercise, which is what we put our clients through. And essentially what that is, is you know, in, a, in a very rudimentary sense, is, is that the company has to justify all of their expenses. And so as opposed to say, we got three trade shows, just put in $10,000 across the board, we actually make them go through a process. What is airfare? How many people are going? Why are these people going? You know, what are the hotel accommodations? What are the car rentals? When do the bills for all these you know, come forth? And that we actually have them organize that in the month that the expense is, is, is recurring. So uh, there's more to zero-based budgeting exercise than, than that, but you know, if you want to find out more about that, we can kind of have that conversation tomorrow night or offline you know, this evening. So then the last thing is, you know, we talk about is, is that, it's, that financial modeling is not, is a resume, res, revenue estimation task with no forethought in planning for how you will acquire customers and revenue. So in other words, when I, you know, when I ask you to consider your financial modeling, your financial planning, I'm asking you to think about it in the form of actual planning, not just another task that you have to get done so that, you know, that you can move on to the next thing. So what are the core elements of the financial model? And you know, there's actually an order to this, and you'll see this in the last slide of the presentation, is you know, the first thing that we want to understand is where is the revenue and, the, you know, and or the income coming from the business? And so when we're doing the, the modeling for business, we actually segment that out by lines of business. So this line of business is projected to do this amount of revenue annually. And we actually will go more granular. We're actually looking at that monthly. Um, but you know, you, that is then totaled. And then you have you know, from all your different lines of business. And then you have you know, the company's projected revenue. Then the next thing that we look at is, is COGS. Now the technical definition of COGS is is cost of goods sold and typically applies to manufacturing and environment. And we're gonna get deeper into what's involved in COGS in just a little bit. But um, for services-based business, there's a number of different ways that you can name it. You can call it core, cost of revenue. You know, there's, it's also called COGS, but it's also, you know, but it's, it's labeled cost of goods and services in, instead of just cost of goods sold. So SG&A &E, SG stands for Selling General Administrative Expenses, and so we'll be covering ground on that in a, in a separate slide. And then one that you have to, to really, really understand and focus on 
is EBITDA, which is earnings before interest, taxes, and amortization. And, you know, and essentially, it, it's more common terminology for you is you have your gross profit and then you have your net profit. So we're going to talk about COGS first. And the, probably the simplest definition of, of COGS that I can give is the direct cost attributable to the production of goods or services sold by the company. And so you'll see a distinct difference between COGS versus SG&A because COGS is focused on, you know, what does it cost to produce the, the product or service that you're putting together? And so there's numerous factors that, that go into to COGS, but, you know, just a few important ones are materials cost, shipping and freight cost, and direct labor cost. Now one thing, because I've been you know, really thinking about this, this slide presentation practically all summer, was you know, why is it important for, for, for each of you to, to, to know this? And you know, essentially, and so you're going to see this on, on some of the slides, why is it important, is you, know, you really do need to understand what all the production costs are going to be in your business. What are all the variables that you know, make up those production costs? And here's why. Because I had you know, a, we'll just say a client that you know, was you know, great, you know, great people, just tremendous people in the organization. They built a product and they invested their life savings in that product. $200,000 of, of life savings. And then you know, and their estimation was that if I sell $200,000 of, of, of you know, well, this is the cost to produce the product, but if I sell X amount of, of product, that I'll make $100,000 in, in net profit in, in return. By the time we got done walking them through everything that was involved in their business, instead of it being $200,000, because they assumed 50% um, margin in the business, they, you know, by the time that they got through, thinking the original assumption being $200,000 to make $100,000, the reality was $950,000 to make $100,000. So I want you to think about that for, for just a moment because, you know, essentially, because they did not recognize that, they were out of business from, from the get-go. And the company is out of business as a result in all their life savings that went with it. So this is a very important, very you know, serious thing to be considering in your business. So you want to also have an understanding of what your gross margin is before factoring in your company operating expenses. And the reason that you want to do that is, is because as you're trying to understand what your cost structure is in your business, you're going to be pulling you know, management levers to, to make your company run profitably and productively. And so you, you know, so, and this is why it's split out, so that you can understand what goes into the product or service itself, and then what goes into the operations behind your, your company. I'll, I'll hold questions so it's a later. So then we go to SG&A. So you can think about it like this. COGS, your product or service that you're selling, SG&A, what it means to actually operate the company itself. So SG&A, selling general administrative expenses, these are the direct costs attributable to running the company itself. And some of the factors to care for in this, and again, there, there's, there's many others, compensation, you know, marketing and sales, professional services, office space, and of course, you know, many more. And I do want to talk a little bit about um, SG&A in, in this function, is you're going to have to find a balancing act in your company. There are going to be costs that are meaningful costs, such as legal, because obviously, you, as you've, if you've come to know in, in several of the presentations, that if you don't care for certain legal inferences or you know, interests properly, that that can get you into a situation where you're going to be outlaying a lot of money, right? And the same thing for accounting. You don't want to be making accounting errors. You don't want legal errors in your business. Um, 
and so when I'm saying this, I'm saying I'm not saying that these things are less important or more important, but I do want you to be cognizant of is, is that your primary, your primary mission in your business is to do what? Make money, right? So your balancing act is, is caring for and protecting yourself. And all the advice that you've been given is just tremendous advice. And quite frankly, just a little pitch, you know, this Square One program, I, I personally feel is, is probably one of the best places in St. Louis to get a comprehensive understanding of all the things that, you, that go into the business. Um, but at the same time, you're gonna be balancing that with things that you actually need to drive revenue. And marketing and sales are your lead generation. So you want to make sure that as you're, you know, as you're covering the cost, because we have this picture in our business that you know, our product or service will just sell itself, right? Because we're focused on how amazing our product or service is, what the problem is that it's solving within, you know, the, within the marketplace. And, you know, and so you, there's kind of this expectation, if you will, that we've seen numerous times that, oh, you know, it will, you know, this, all we have to do is build it and they'll, and they'll come. And that's not, you know, the reality then, you know, hits and, you know, and then you're behind the eight ball on your marketing and sales cost. And, you know, because you're going to have to now include that to, to actually you know, move your, your product or service, if you will. Um, and so you want to plan for that, find balance between the things that are very important in professional services, but also find balance in the things and have it planned for early on, you know, what is going to drive sales, what is going to drive revenue in, into my business. So why is it important? Understand what the expenses are to run your business understand what commitments actually drive revenue in your business model and what constitutes unnecessary expense. So that's a little bit different than what I just said. And it is, you know, so there's things that are legal, there's things that are professional services accounting that are, um, that are very necessary expenses. There are also things that are unnecessary expenses. And remember, you know, and we're going to be talking about this in just a, a, another slide. It's not just about revenue. So doing things that are unnecessary in your business are things that you want to be caring for when you're, when you're talking about, you know, SG&A. So some of this, I'm just going to briefly cover this. These are some myths that I have literally heard or I've seen written about in, in St. Louis. And um, so I just kind of want to address them here. And the first one, everybody knows that financial models in St. Louis are not even remotely accurate. When investors need to see your model, so you just have to labor in putting it together. It's a task. So, hey, you know, just plug in estimates if, 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 if you're stuck. You know, and there's a, everything that we do at Atomic Revenue falls around this premise. Inputs equal outputs. If the inputs are poor going in, then you can't expect the outputs to be you know, accurate or, or spectacular. So you hit, the more care that you put into the inputs in your financial planning, the better your outputs will be, the more accurate your, your end model will be, and the better you will be able to have line of sight into assessing the capabilities of your business. Um, the other one is make sure you show as much revenue as possible so that revenue investors will be interested. You can figure out what the real numbers are once they have invested. So, what, you know, so this is, I'm going to actually make this part a little bit interactive. What do you see as the potential pitfalls in that? Yes, actually, that's that that can be very very correct. But you know, how do you? Who is your investor? Who are they? 
at the point you bring them on board, who are they? They're your partners. That's exactly it. They're your partners. And do you really want to build a trust-based relationship, which is the foundation of sales with, you know, with, oh, well, you know, now that you've given us our money, here's what the, what the real numbers are, <laughs> right? So when we talked about this, it's not just about revenue. You have to care for, for certain things in your business. That you know, one thing that you don't want is low gross margin. Because if you have low gross margin, that means you don't have the money to care for your, your selling general and administrative expenses. So you know, that's why you want to pay particular importance to your cost of goods sold. The other thing that you want to, you know, that you really want to do is, is to care for your net profit. Because at the end of the day, it is, you know, revenue is obviously very important because it drives everything else. It's how you pay for everything else. But the business is based on profit. I mean, you have a successful business when you have profit in it, at, you know, after, after you pay taxes. And so the one thing you know that I'm you know that we promote is is accuracy in your business model. And you know, because you know if you're if you have again inputs equal outputs, if you're accurate in your business model, then you have line of sight into the real capabilities of the business, not only in terms of what the real capabilities of the business are but also in terms of what resources that you need to commit to, to, to execute on, on, on your business. And so when you're making mistakes in that, when you put, use plug-in numbers, you know, when you're just best guesstimating without you know, even taking the time to put some thought of, well, what really goes into this, then you're making mistakes. And mistakes essentially are rework and they're extra expense. Oh, we got the price wrong. We experimented on price. We didn't, you know, we just thought we'd try this price. Now we have to go back and redo that. But you know what? We also sent out the, all our, our sales and marketing collateral that had that old price. So given that that doesn't work, we probably now have to, to throw all that into the, into, the, into the trash bin and, you know, and send out to the printer to, to, to change all the pricing. So you know, I want you, I really do want you to remember that you know, mistakes in your business that you know, seemingly are small today magnify over the course of time. So the thing that has driven a lot of interest in, in our financial model, again, it's a budgetary exercise, not, a, not an accounting exercise is that we do scenario-based customer acquisition modeling. And so what this allows a company to do is to test certain pricing scenarios and you know, against demand curves, against you know, other you know, types of expenses that, that, get, you know, that, are, that are tied in the price, and they can test assumptions. And additionally, we can, you know, we're walking them through an exercise of how do you actually acquire customers. So a, a sample, you know, of, of how we do that, you know, might look, you know, I, I always like to go back to the tried and true example, is I might say something like, so I'm seeing, you know, it's always, when it's the same number across a row of months, I'm always, all the, all the, the, the red alert alarms start going off with me. But, um, you know, I might look at, you know, a model and say, okay, so, I see that you're doing 5% increase in sales month over month. So, okay, you know, I get that. You know, here's what I don't understand. You have 5% in May, 5% in June, 5% in July. You're a Christmas tree business, so you have to explain to me how you are making, you know, gains 5% month over month in the in the in the in the in, in May, June, July, August, which are the hottest hottest months of the year. So you know, in that, does that company have a have? Does that sound like something that would be an invalid you know financial model? Show of hands that say yes. Anybody say not necessarily? Because I would say not necessarily. 
And, you know, and, and I would use one simple example. Again, evidence-based decisions is, yeah, well, we kind of got this little side business. It's called frozen custard. So, <laughs> you know, we're Ted Drews. So you know, in that case, you know, I think we're good with the 5% with the, with the increases, you know, month over month. But that's what you're kind of doing when you're actually scenario basis, uh, you know, and you're actually modeling customer acquisition, is you're going through all those variables of how do we actually acquire customers, what makes sense. So within that, and this gets to be a little bit more, you know, complicated or, or a little bit deeper, and I guess would be the better thing to say is, is that you know, we want to put measurement around you know, customer acquisition cost. So when you're talking to investors, experienced investors, seasoned investors, customer acquisition costs all of a sudden becomes a, a, a big deal. And essentially what customer acquisition cost is, is you know, something along these lines is great, you know, it's when every time you acquire a customer, you $1,000, but once I start adding up all the things with your marketing and sales expenses to acquire that customer, I'm coming up with um, $900. So that's probably, you know, pretty, pretty high. Um, its technical definition is the, the sales acquisition cost divided by the number of new customers acquired. For instance, if you spend $1.5 million in acquisition, you have 1,600 new customers, and in its simplest form, $937.50 a, a, a customer. Lifetime value, and I'll, I'll basically briefly touch over this, is, is a measurement of the value of your customer over X period of time. One of the factors that goes into that is, is that you're calculating a retention rate also over X period of time. And then the final thing, when we're talking about understanding the, the sales dynamics in your business model is what we call requirements-based pricing, which is essentially understanding how price impacts both revenue production and the demand curve in, in your pricing model. Because the more that you, you potentially increase your price, there's at least the potential that your demand goes down. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Because remember, is at least in most business models, it, and there are exceptions to the rule, it's, you know, you're, it's, it's about making the most profit, not necessarily the most you know, revenue. So you know, the thing is, is that you're, you, you want to ensure that proper markup exists to care for gross margin, cost of sales, SG&A, and of course, EBITDA. So when we talk about elements of predictable revenue, it is, you know, we're looking at lead generation and sales conversion. So, you know, we're wanting you to understand all the factors which affect your per, you know, particular lead generation and what it is for you is going to be different than what it is for you, right? Because it's just dependent on, on the business. And so things that, uh, that, you know, that we're looking at and that we're looking to assess is lead quality and lead quantity. So it's not just lead quantity because if I just had a thousand leads that never convert into anything, then that's probably not going to be very useful to your business. So the other thing, you know, when we're talking about lead generation, you know, that I think is often overlooked is operational bandwidth. So you literally, you know, you have this problem that you can sell yourself out of business. Because let's say you have software as a service, you have a SaaS model, and then all of a sudden, you, you know, for some reason it goes viral and now you have all these orders and you have essentially two people that you know, are focused on onboarding customers. Now you have problems, right? So when you're modeling revenue, when you're doing your financial planning, you wanna make sure that you have the, you know, that you're committing the right resources on the, on the back end of, of the sale to, to care for actually, you know, again, if it's within your particular business model to, to implement and to successfully close the sale on, you know, when I say close the sale, I don't mean the signed contract because in our viewpoint, in our world, we don't view a sale as being closed at the point that you sign contract. That's just one step of the process. We actually view your sale as being closed at the point that you actually solve your problem for your customer. So if you're doing, if you have 
a thousand contracts, but then you only have the staff that can, you know, that can maybe do, you know, one or two implementations a month, then that might be, that might be an issue. So sales conversion, we're looking at lead conversion, MQL and SQL, which I won't get too much into in this session, are marketing qualified leads and sales qualified leads. These are definitions within the sales operations discipline, um, lifetime value of the customer, and then also you know, has its applicable client attention. So you know, the big thing for you know, the, you know, to consider when we talk about pricing strategy is that markup is not margin. And you know, I'm going to actually get technical because I, I have the definition and I don't want to, sometimes when you're up on stage you have the tendency to reverse things and I don't want to do that, so. So the you know, markup is the percentage difference between the product's selling price and its cost. And gross margin is the percentage of profit created in selling the product or service and its selling price. So you know, it, you, what you want to care for is that there's enough markup in your, in your product or service that will get you the appropriate gross margin and a net margin, again, net profit. In, in your business. So, you know, has, you know, at least the people from the IT track that were, you know, when, when ML came in and talked about pricing strategy, when we speak to that, we're talking about, you know, four things. Price calculation, which we actually, when we actually incorporate in our financial modeling, we don't incorporate that in our pricing strategy module because that's how important price is to, to basically planning the, you know, the, the financial operations within your business. But then, you know, beyond that, once you have the right price with the appropriate markup, you have to do a competitive evaluation of that price. And, you know, so where you're comparing against competitors, price positioning, which is positioning your price, you know, within the, the marketplace and then the actual physical presentation of the price itself. So those are the factors that go into that. And you know, if anybody wants to learn more or you know, more about that, I think it was week four, week five, that you get, there's actually a slide deck from, from, from ML that, that covers that ground in a little bit more detail. So I wanted to maybe just talk about a couple of things in modeling customer acquisition. You know, there are numerous things that we cover, but some of the most important is you know, lead generation, having plan and making sure that there's coordination between you know, the leads as they come in and then your effort to convert those leads, which is your marketing and your sales effort. You know, sales cycle length, does anybody know what I mean by that? Isn't it how long it takes from the time in which you first contact someone to the time in which they actually hand you money for the yes. business or something? Yes. So obviously that's going to be different. If you're Amazon, that process can take as little as nine seconds with the one-click ordering, right? And obviously with Boeing, you know, that could take, you know, years in, in, in some cases. So you really need to have an understanding of what, what your sales cycle is and what all the elements are in that sales cycle. How many meetings are you going to have? You know, what is the length between those meetings? So on and so forth. What are the marketing resources needed to, do, to deliver that sale? As far as, you know, collateral, social media, you know, all of the standard things, you know, well, uh, I'm not the marketing expert, you know, it's so it's, you know, we've had other people you know, pre in, the, in the program present on that. Human capital costs, you know, need it. It's, you know, one thing that I've seen is, is that, you know, is it, you, we, we hear what's called the hockey stick revenue. And that, you know, who knows, who's heard of the hockey stick? Show of hands. Okay. So the hockey stick, basically, the reason it's called that is because the company's year one revenue is maybe, let's say, $200,000. And then in year two, you know, it's, it's you know, $438,000. And then in year three, it's suddenly $40 million. 
And so you, know, you have, you know, so when you actually graph that out, it essentially looks the equivalent of a, of a hockey stick because it goes, it shoots way up. Now, I will say that there are certain circumstances when uh, you know, what's, you know, what's called an ARR or MRR model will produce a hockey stick level revenue and, you know, because there's not a lot of resources you know, comparatively that are needed to go from X amount of revenue to Y amount of revenue. But for most businesses, especially services businesses, is if you're going from you know 600,000 to even you know 800,000 or 1.2 million dollars of revenue it usually means that you're needing to commit more marketing and sales resources or other operational resources to, to get there um, pricing and demand curve you know which we talked about you know the, the in its most elementary form is I raise the price and you know, potentially demand goes down. I just wanted to comment, the only place in the physical goods world that I think I've realistically seen a hockey stick is if you were a product that's proven yourself out maybe regionally or on some smaller level, and then you land a large retailer. Not Walmart, but a large retailer. Something like that overnight, just on landing a, a reasonably decent sized account. That's a perfectly normal and acceptable course of doing business, 100% believable, but it has a significant impact and it will show as a hockey stick. And that's a great point and, you know, and, and it kind of alludes to you know, is I have this attitude when I'm going in, you know, I'll see something and I was like, that doesn't make any sense. But I always ask, can you explain that for me? Because you know, with explanation, that's when I, you really have the ability to make an evidence-based decision about what makes sense and what doesn't. Otherwise, you're bound by assumptions, and assumptions you know, can be dangerous things, especially when you're talking about financial modeling. So market segmentation, uh, you know, cost of sale. Again, we talked about operational constraints. In MRR and AR models, which is annual recurring revenue or monthly recurring revenue, churn factors. So great, we sign up you know, 100 customers a month, but on the back end, we're losing you know, 90. So that's, you know, in, you know, so churn drives up cost of sale and uh, you know, it has a number of other detriments when you're actually modeling customer acquisition that you have to care for when, when modeling the business. So, so this is you know, understanding the investment conversation. These are just a couple of myths that are, you know, that, you know, again, things that I've actually heard. Um, financial models are never accurate. You need to have one in the back pocket in case we're asked for it, but it's not as important as our product or story. Um, and this one is a repeat is, you know, but I did that on purpose because I think there needs to be a point of emphasis on it. In the competitive funding world, investors need to see as much revenue as possible by year X. So it's a primary importance to always show the hockey stick level of revenue. Otherwise, they won't invest with me. They'll invest in somebody else that is showing that. Um, and then the, you know, myth number three is, is my PowerPoint presentation is an expression of my business story and the financials are just the spreadsheet that speaks to the numbers behind that story. The, the, you know, and, and this is actually the one I'm going to key on, is, is that I would, you know, we advise our clients that you know, there's the numbers, but they're numbers, you know, but essentially at the end of the day, you're having a conversation with your investors, you're, you're telling a story about your numbers, and that it's important that your numbers are actually part of the narrative of your story and that they align with the narrative of, of, of your story. They're just not something to whip out at the end and say, ooh, look at that exciting product and look how, much, how many customers we're going to have by 2020. And oh, by the way, here's the numbers on it. And then you know, quickly, quickly duck them down. So, um, This is just one page. We probably have you know, in ours you know, eight, nine, ten tabs you know, that, that basically cover you know, a lot of the ground that we're, we're talking about. But you know, we're, we actually in this are, you know, here is your revenue sources. This is your, your cost of goods. Here's all the SG&A expenses. 
and what we can do, you know, or, and what you want to pay attention to is, is that we can calculate burn rates. In other words, you know, let's say you have $500,000 and we can tell month by month, we can only tell this if it's, if it's done accurately, if the financials are done accurately, if the inputs are accurately, you know, month, are accurate month over month. Then we can give the client a, a much better approximation, approximation of what their burn is than relative to, you know, literally investors, you know, how much, you know, they'll ask this question. So how much money are you asking for? And, you know, oh, I don't know, 200, 500, you know, what do you got in your back pocket? You know, we'll, we'll, we'll take it. And, you know, and the thing is, is that, again, if we speak to this in a narrative form, you know, you are selling, which means you're not trying to convince your investor, you're trying to educate your investor, but words matter. And if you're, you know, if you give the impression, you know, from an investor's perspective that you're flipping about your financials, guess what? You know, unless your product is, is seen as just absolutely, you know, groundbreaking, you're, you probably just erase your chances of getting investment. And here's the thing, St. Louis has an abundance of ideas. It's, you know, it's not the ideas that are in scarcity. It is the, the ability of, you know, they're investing in your ability to basically run a business in addition to the excitement behind your product and, and services. So with that, man, you guys were awesome. It was, it was, it's, you know, questions. Um, a lot of your initial slides at the beginning of your presentation used the word time. And I think that time is a very important thing that comes out of properly modeling and being able to apply time to making key business decisions. So you talked a little about factoring time when you're making decisions throughout the year and why using the model helps in that and maybe give some examples. Yeah, it, well, you know, it allows you to make, you know, speed decisions, it, you know, when we're working with, you know, and if I'm not capturing this properly, just let, let me know, is, is that you're making evidence-based decisions about you know, what, what you need to do with your business. Remember we talked about what levers to pull? When you have the ability to see that and, you know, and to know with a degree of certainty, and let's actually talk about that for a moment too. It's, you know, I don't wave a magic wand with these, with these clients and then say, you know, presto, you have 100% accuracy in your, in, your, in, your, in your financial model. That's not what it's about. It's, you know, we're looking for a range. We typically like them to be within 70, you know, 75, 85% to 135% of plan because guess what you know because we want them to over you know outperform their financial model because if you think about it if you're outperforming your financial model that engenders what with your investor trust right so if i said to you you know is you know you're performing at 543% of your of your of your plan does that engender trust with your with your investor not really. And why? Because if you have that large a uh, percentage over your uh, your estimate, then there are undoubtedly things that you didn't plan for on the expense side that you're suddenly going to have to. That is that is exactly right. So I mean, obviously, it's better to be you know over your your projection than you know what are you performing at? Uh, yeah, we're at you. 3.8 percent, you know, of, of, of our plan, but that's that's exactly right. You know, what that would say to me is is that you know, is it's good news story. Don't get me wrong. On one level, it's a very good news story, but it also says to me they really don't have an understanding of you know of the inputs into their in their business quite yet. Ryan, what do you? Th uh, so just coming back to the time question that Clinton asked a minute ago. So I think what you're saying there is that you want to track how you're doing versus your plan, especially on the revenue side, yes. and make sure that if revenues are falling short, you know how you're going to address that so that you don't then run out of money. That's or on the other hand, if revenues are, are like way ahead of plan, you know, what kind of changes do you have to make? So the timing thing is it, it kind of, if you monitor it closely month by month, basically, ideally, right. then you know how you can change things in, 
you know, anticipating where you're going to end up at the year or, or heaven forbid, when you run out of money, uh, you know, if you need to raise additional money or figure out, it gives you the ability to plan. That's and so there's something called leading indicators and, and lagging indicators. And we submit that, you know, revenue is, is kind of a lagging indicator. But, you know, what would be a leading indicator is, is growth rate. So assuming all the variables are constant is, is that you're growing year, year, in year over year. So I'm 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, now 15%, now 12%, now 8%. So my revenue keeps increasing, but my rate of growth is starting to decline. That is a you know, leading indicator. So now you can make, you know, you can assess the business as what's slowing down the rate of growth and pull the levers accordingly to, you know, to, to, to bring that up, is assuming that those factors are, are controllable. Yeah, another great example of a leading indicator for revenue, for example, would be if, you're, uh, if you anticipated that you needed to make say 10 sales calls per week in order to generate revenue, and now you, you're actually only successful in achieving about three when all of a sudden done, then you can anticipate that that's going to have an impact on your revenue well in advance of actually you know, the time when the revenue would come in. So another good example of that. You know. It's like a dashboard, right? For you know, when, again, these things are not you know going to be a hundred you know because they're projections right but you know the the idea is is if you're careful and you have given you know real consideration about the things the inputs that are going into your business you know suddenly your projections are going to be much more accurate and then you have line of sight to make decisions now going back to the time question with the both of you and you know, I still feel like I'm maybe missing something on that. Or have I answered that question? That's pretty good. One of the examples uh, that I like that I've heard you use before actually is the uh, decision of like when to hire an employee yeah. based off of based off of what month and performance that month. So yes. No, that's actually a great point. So you know, the thing is, is if your projections are on on, on par, this is a common problem that companies you know face. Is, is that you know, when they don't have the financial projections is, is that you know, is all, you know, we're, you know, sales are going great, sales are going great, oh my gosh, we have to actually you know, start operationalizing. We need more of X, whether that is customer service, whether that is more salespeople, whether that is more of, of anything that's going to help you operate the business you know, more efficiently and functionally. And the thing is, is if you don't have any line of sight into that, at what point do you start hiring? At the point you have need, right? And so now you have this immediate need right now, but you know, but start, you know, now we have to go source candidates, we have to do all the human resources, we have to conduct interviews, you know, we have to determine compensation, we have to do all these things. Everything that it takes to hire. A person and, and you know our, and do our best diligence to get that right, and so that could take two, three, sometimes even four, you know, or more months. And so now you're behind the eight ball, you know. Whereas you know, is if you have a financial model that has a degree of accuracy to it, now you can start to say, you know, you know, we're eighty-two percent of our revenues, or we're one hundred and six percent of our revenues. So you know, there do, do not seem to be any changes in the business that would, would, would warrant these projections going one way or the other. So we know at this point that in May, we're in January now, in May we're gonna need to have another, you know, we're gonna need to have this person. So we need to start that hiring process right now. And see the difference? Now you're, you know, now you're starting that process in January to hire right when you need it, versus starting in May, and then you don't have that person hired until, until August or September and, you know, or July or whenever it is. And then you know, for each month that goes by, that's pain, that's operational pain, because then you have to figure out ways and you have to devote your energy toward figuring out ways to make things work until you can get that person onboarded. Plus compensation. Plus like, compensation. Like that's, a, that's absolutely accurate, but also like having a good model allows you to not go into that blind. If you're going in last minute and trying to hire someone, you're probably also questioning how much you can afford to pay that person versus if you planned it out and you thought about when you need to expand, 
um, and what your revenues are, you probably also have a pretty good idea of what you can afford for a salary for that person versus going in and just hoping that they don't try to get you to a higher price. So it's a lot more powerful position from a negotiation of salary standpoint that you want to be in as a community. Yeah, if you haven't budgeted cash flow or you don't have the net person you know, profit to, to, to hire that person, now you've got issues there too. So it's an excellent point, Clinton. Um, you know, you know, um, I know you mentioned talking about uh, manufacture or service business. If it's a uh, R&D business, uh, is there any you know, change in the model? Yeah. Research and development is, 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 is actually probably the most challenging, of, you know, at least in my experience, you know, to, 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 to model because, you know, it, it and again, you know, it's, this is why I really respect, you know, the, you know like in, in, in biotech and, and everything because there's so much advanced planning that happens years in advance. I actually learned this from my conversations with, with, with Harry is before you ever make dollar one of, of, of revenue. It is, we can model most any, any business. It's, you know, we do, you know, we do have a much greater reluctance for, you know, for companies that do to model that for research and development because there's so many variables that go into that. And since, you know, obviously we charge for our services, you know, we're looking to get, you know, an act, you know, a, a, a successful output for those. And it, it does make it challenging. And, you know, so we typically, when we're, you know, and I know this is probably too detrimental of a bio, but we, you know, we, we typically, you know, are reluctant to take on bio customers, biotech customers, because of you know all the different things, you know, the variables that go into into modeling their business. So you know, Harry, I might just look Thank to you. Lot, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> so you know, so first of all, let's be clear about one thing. Did you mean research and development that you're going to spend to develop a better offering to offer customers? Are you or are you talking about services you provide to a customer? that would be properly classified as a research and development expense? I think both. Yeah, okay. So in the first case, right, you do have to put that on a separate line that's an expense that's not associated with the sale, and that's a research and development investment that you're gonna hope pays off in an enhanced service at some point down the road. And so you, underneath typically SG&A, Depends. Some some type people do it different ways, but somewhere in the expense area, you indicate how much you're going to invest in research and development. Okay. So in the in the case though where you're offering a research service to somebody, then that work that you're going to do is to a certain extent your cost of goods. So the costs that are associated with fulfilling the sale, and you can account for it more properly that way. And it, you know there's there's variations in between in terms of how you would classify them. So if from that, beyond that general statement, it becomes more complicated. But I think it's important to bear in mind that there's two different things that people mean when they say research and development. You need to be clear about which one it is uh, when you go to think about putting it in your uh, financial and the litmus test for that is essentially, you know, is it, you know, is it viewed as company expense or is it viewed as product, you know, expense? And it actually spurred a line of thinking is, is that some of these answers are not hard and fast. Some of these, you know, from an accounting standpoint, in speaking to the accountants about this, is, is that, you know, is that, you know, like when you're figuring out compensation, you know, your em employee wages, that typically goes into SG&A, but if, it, if those wages contribute to, it has direct labor costs to the production of, of the product, then guess what? Suddenly now it, it can be considered a COGS expense. Yeah. And that's where you would want to, you know, that's where you start to move past a budgetary exercise and then picking up the phone and, and calling your accountant and saying, you know, this is, you know, this is basically how we you know, how we produce this good. Would that how would you characterize it as a as a COGS expense or SGNA expense? So we can go into more detail. Yeah, I have I have I have her in the back, and then I have you, and then I have you. So, and we have five minutes. And we have five minutes. This is, okay, so I'll make it quick. 
if I'm doing a financial model and it's starting off with just myself as a service provider, um, do I add in, like, okay, if I'm projecting out at like quarter three, this is what I expect business to, business to look like, and then the cost of the like having an employee or another consultant at that point, or do you have two separate models, <coughs> or, or is it okay to have two separate models with like you and like a contingency? financial model in case it doesn't ramp up to where you think it should be. It obviously, you know, yeah, I, I don't think that there's a, a yes, no, or right, wrong answer to, to that one. Um, you know, it is, you know, I might question then is if you're having to do two separate models, you know, what's, you know, what's driving that, you know, what is the, you know, when you say it's not as successful, you know, we're typically taking a client through what are all, you know, all the inputs of the, you know, for, for customer acquisition, for instance, and, you know, and, and so, you know, it could be an issue that you're not taking into account all the impacts, or it could be an issue where you are taking into account the, the impacts, but there's certainly controllable variables and uncontrollable variables. So uncontrollable variable number one, we're going to model around this, uncontrollable variable number two, if this happens instead of this, then we're going to model, model this. But you know, depending on the complexity of your financial model, that could, that could be, grow to be a, a, a mammoth exercise in and of itself. So my question was uh, specifically about software as a service and customer service. So customer service is a significant part of the cost of goods, I think, but it's also compensation. Depends. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of these things that, you know, that, that depends. I would say from your comment, you know, is of the companies that are most prone to actually have realistic hockey stick, it would be software as a service companies, you know, anything that's monthly recurring revenue, which monthly recurring revenue is, you know, I keep paying you $30 a month and building a subscriber base, you know, for instance. That's, that's basically what monthly recurring revenue is. I do that monthly or I do that annually is, is annual recurring revenue. So I know that one's probably not a complete answer to your question, but we can talk about that one. I wanna make sure we get the last one in and, and hold our time. Uh, what resources would you recommend if we wanna get deeper and further into this? Why I would recommend the library, <laughs> and it's you know so the library would, would be a good you know resource. You have mentors in the in the I ten program, um, and, and you know obviously you know we do it, but we you know we 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 charge. But you know I'm so I'm guessing you're probably at this stage you're probably looking at you know cost very cost effective you know resources. Um, also your workshop tomorrow night. Yeah, and then the workshop tomorrow night, you know, where, where, where we'll be doing these, and you know, there's no charge for, 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 for that, so that would be a, a, a good, re thanks for, you know, thanks for, for, for that ad. Could you send us that template to sample the financial? Well, the reason is, that there's a reason why it's blurry, and there's a reason why it's low res, and there's a reason why it's also not on the, the slideshow presentation that you, that you, that, that you I have the template However, we will be working with the real live one tomorrow. So, if you want to see it up up close and in personal, you, you 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 know we can we can certainly do so, so that you can see what goes into to that when we talk about all those those extra tabs. So, that's it. Thank you very much for. You know.